So with no further ado, and hopefully we'll get some stragglers coming in, um, Dave Shorter's going to kick it off to how and why the fractures. Uh, uh, thanks for having me. Um, you know, I was joking. I have 75 slides to get through, so we should probably start. No, I'm just, uh, it's not that painful, hopefully. So uh, I'm the newest guy in the Towson Orthopedic Group. Uh, this is part of a concerted effort to provide comprehensive care, as Neil said, and also uh, to put our, just to say what we have to offer, especially from an orthopedic perspective, and then to also provide a little bit of review of what we do. Um, and you know our glorified carpenter roots but basically hip fractures overview i wanted to talk about and, and go through this in an expeditious manner but the epide epidemiology why are we here why are we talking about this because uh, you know there's obviously a health impact uh, what are the treatment goals at different stages uh, from the emt to the emergency room to the floor to us and then home out the door people like kathy mulford to help with uh, preventing this from happening again um, I'm going to go over our anatomy, the way that we sort of look at and, and how we break it down um, as orthopedic surgeons, and then just review sort of the, some of the preoperative goals again and the operative choices that we have. Finally, just, you know, prognosis and, and try to s summarize this with why would you want to, you know, be treated here. Um, this is a serious health concern. Hip fractures are uh, a big problem in this country. Over uh, a quarter of a million occur and this was numbers based out of 2010 study. They project that it's going to go up to nearly 300,000 over the next 15 years or so. And women are actually decreasing, but this is highly offset by men living longer. And so we're seeing an incredible increase in male patients, and we'll talk about the implications of that uh, later in the talk. These are pretty damning figures that life expectancy for these already elderly folks may decrease on average by nearly two years, 25% of the remaining life in some cases. And a lot of this will be spent in a nursing facility, a huge lifetime cost for this procedure beyond uh, the hospital itself, nearly half of which is for a skilled nursing facility and care thereafter. And so the deficits in their activities of daily living, that's the whole focus of this. And the morbidity, mortality, and costs associated with that decrease in their ability during, to get through their day is what we're here talking about. So even when we, even when we fix these fractures, okay, this is on our, these are on our good days, that often there's transfusion in these patients. Um, they spend anywhere up, you know, close to a week in the hospital in some cases. And even with fixing them, one in five die within a year of their fracture. That's, that's pretty startling when you compare other procedures that we do, certainly as orthopedic surgeons. And one in, one in three, 33%, will be in assisted living for a year or more. 40% will need a cane or go to a lower level of ambulatory status than they came in with. If they, if they were at one status, they'll go a rung below. And then for our side, up to 10% of these fixate fail. So I wanted to just quickly go over anatomy because you know we have all sorts of names and we have all sorts of, I, I joke with my patients we go to medical school to learn fancy speaking um, when it really comes down to the, the level of the fracture doesn't really matter as much as just trying to break it up between femoral neck fractures and fractures around the bony prominences of the, pro, of the proximal femur uh, the trochanters and the words that we tend to use are femoral neck fractures. A lot of us will still use intertrochanteric fractures, but probably more commonly in our literature, we'll start to use pertrochanteric fractures in and around uh, intertroch because they don't always read the textbook, so to speak. So why did this displacement occur as it does? These are the main attachments to the proximal femur. The upper arrow is showing evidence of where the abductors attach. This arrow right here is the iliopsoas tendon. And then down here, the gluteus maximus sling. And they all operate in their normal planes of action. And depending where the break is, is going to determine where those fragments go and how the fracture will displace. So in terms of how we describe it, you know, we, you know, we, we don't get caught up so much anymore. I mean, they torture us as residents of describing exactly you know, what the Evans classification is, what's the garden classification for femoral neck fractures. All that is good and well, but it really comes down to is it stable or is it not stable? And stable is defined as an ability to accept loading, and this is really determined by two factors. How many fragment, fragments are there? You know, how much comminution are we seeing? And then what is the plane of the main 
course of energy through the proximal fragment. And that's going to determine what we do with it. So preoperatively, we really want to, this is where we very much rely on our medicine colleagues to help sort of tune the patient well and, and get comorbidities that are correctable optimized as best we can. It's been known for nearly 20 years, and, and you know, we were talking about this beforehand with Jay, that you know, it's really become a spotlight in, in JAMA and other journals more recently. But in the orthopedic literature, for 20, nearly 20 years, we know that we have to get to these as quickly as we can. But by the same token, we don't have to do these in the middle of the night. Um, when you don't necessarily have your full team available, or the people in the operating room might be those that usually do spine surgery and we need to do a hip fracture. Um, we want all, all of our team members available. Um, a big key is maintain the extremity in a position of comfort. A lot of times we get, we get asked, you know, what do I do with the extremity? Do I use Buck's traction? Do I need to do this or that? And Buck's traction really isn't needed in the vast majority of these cases, especially in the population that we're focusing on tonight. These are elderly patients. Comfort is the key. They don't have huge quadriceps musculature that's going to try to shorten these fragments like a 20-year-old in a massive car accident will, will want to do. Um, and then the case of general versus spinal anesthesia. This is something that's been looked at for a very long time. Um, and spinal anesthesia has shown decreased pulmonary complications, um, has shown decreased mortality with intertrochanteric and pertrochanteric fractures, but no difference really in the femoral neck fractures. And we're not sure why. What is far more important is what's their ASA classification when it comes to anesthesiologists. That determines their comorbidities and their, their comorbidities after surgery um, and their mortality after surgery to a much uh, better correlation. So in the field, and uh, you know, I, for the paramedics and EMTs, you do what you do best. You know, you, you get the ABCs is, is number one. Same thing I tell my corpsman in the field is what I would tell, you know, any, any paramedic. And, and you guys usually do a great job with this. Um, get them immobilized, get them safely to a stretcher. And you're the face of help for these people. You know, some of these patients are found down for hours at a time. They live independently. They don't have anyone checking on them. And so I think it's unbelievably critical for our first responders and, and, and sort of being a, a ray of hope for these poor folks. Um, I think if the fracture or deformity of the femur or other fracture, especially if it's a polytrauma, if these are obvious, then absolutely, you know, we're, I was joking beforehand saying do the Boy Scout thing and pull inline traction. You're never going to impart more energy than the floor did, okay, or the car did, all right? It's, it's, so it's rarely that you're going to break them more, and that's always a concern. How hard do you pull? Um, if the patient, obviously, if they're hypotensive, if they're tachycardic, you know, having IV access in the field and getting a big gauge needle in is, is, is again, it's part of your guy's vernacular. It comes as second nature. Um, Radiographs when you hit the door in the emergency department. Often an AP pelvis and a cross table lateral are more than adequate. Uh, I find less and less do we really need a CT scan. Those are for the subtle ones that may be minimally displaced. That's great to get. And you know, when in doubt, as a resident, certainly we did traction views. Um, I don't. I think we do this more to torture the residents than actually giving us additional information because we're going to do this in the operating room anyway. When I show you the setup there. So goals in house, really, it's usually a first generation cephalosporin that's needed uh, perioperatively, and then usually in the postoperative period for an additional two doses. A big concern is obviously there's a thromboembolic risk with these folks. So as, so as soon as we can tolerate even mechanical devices, especially on the contralateral lower extremity, I think that's very much worthwhile. I think we, uh, as surgeons, will, often, will always put these folks on post-operative DVT prophylaxis, chemo prophylaxis. Um, and it's difficult to do nutritional supplementation in 48 hours, but it's certainly something to be concerned about in their management perioperatively. I think a key is to avoid snowing these patients. You know, control their pain, but don't snow them because delirium has its own independent uh, predictor of success in terms of comorbidities and morbidity postoperatively. Um, and then pressure sores, always, always, always be aware of pressure sores. And you know, when you folks bring them into the hospital or bring them into the emergency department, we always want to get them off the bed, off the board, and onto a well padded surface. And then, depending how sick they are, that's a consideration we always have to have in the back of our mind. Early mobilization out of bed, um, once we get them fixed, is 
that's, that's why we're here. That's why you see the orthopedic surgeon with these injuries. Um, you want early planning, work with our discharge team, work with the internal medicine providers, work with our uh, uh, you know, multidisciplinary caregivers to get them to a safe location um, in terms of skilled nursing. Ideally to home because those outcomes tend to be better. Um, and then of course, I don't want to steal Kathy's uh, thunder for later, but you want to be considering workup for all these patients for osteoporosis. Um, our operative goals are fairly straightforward. You know, this, this is what we can control. We can get the correct reduction in the fracture. We have to choose the right implant and we have to put it in the right spot. Um, and that's, that's on us because that very much predicts how well that implant's gonna work. When we're speaking about femoral neck fractures, um, really comes down to three cannulated screws if it's a non-displaced fracture. And I'm gonna hand out a model if you guys wanna take a look at this. Um, and you know, we, what we try to do is get those in the sort of the far reaches as peripherally as we can in the femoral neck, especially posterior, uh, superiorly. Uh, because that serves as a buttress to help keep the, the neck fracture stable. And we often use these really for the, for the non-displaced or valgus impacted femoral neck fractures. Um, we don't use these for displaced fractures. Hemiarthroplasty and total hip arthroplasties. Uh, it's been shown in multiple studies that for displaced fractures, these are far better than attempting cannulated screws. I think cannulated screws, even in younger patients, are not good options for open reduction internal fixation. Reoperation rate is one quarter uh, with the arthroplasty options that it is with the open reduction internal fixation options. Um, and this has been shown especially if you have a younger elderly patient or physiologically younger patient, you might consider a total hip arthroplasty as opposed to half a hip. And I have a model of a total hip here. I know it's, you know, everyone's seen it, but it's nice to play with the toys that are provided by, uh, or used to be provided by by companies, but you can see what a total hip looks like. Uh, see? I set you up for that, actually. I set you up. That's a dislocated total hip. That's polytrauma. Um, external fixation, surprisingly, has been used in Europe. Uh, we certainly use it in a battlefield setting, um, but it doesn't really have a place in 2013 in suburban Maryland. Um, this is something that in open fractures I would certainly consider, however. Intertrochanteric fractures, pertrochanteric fractures, that's sort of the next flavor. You really come down to, to two different devices. You have an intermedullary nail and you have a compressive hip screw. Um, there's sort of religious argument of when you're gonna use one over the other. I would say that the screw we tend to use with the more unstable patterns and that that intermedullary nail we tend to use more frequently today. For a while it was actually coated higher. So there was a bad incentive to do the nail over the dynamic hip screw, the compressive hip screw. And then different types of nails are shown there in the bottom. Less frequently, we'll use external fixation and then the arthroplasty options. As an arthroplasty trained surgeon, arthroplasty is something that if you go in with these de novo, you're gonna be losing a lot of bone. You're gonna to have to use a revision type implant and it makes it much harder. I'd much rather try to fix what we can, get it to heal whatever we can, and then go back to fight another day and get the patient better optimized. This is just real quick how we set them up in this crazy position in the operating room. But what we look for is we use the large C-arm there to just give us orthogonal views and watch the reduction. And almost all of us will do the case before we do the case. And that is we're gonna put them under traction. We're gonna get the fracture fragments aligned. We're gonna use things like crutches and supports to get it perfectly aligned before we fire the implant. Now, post-operative course, you know, our, our goal, and I'm guilty of the first one, allowing all patients to weight bearing is tolerated. Sometimes I chicken out if there's a lot of comminution, and I don't necessarily trust my construct that I'll, I'll do 50%. But when the actuality, uh, the actual nature of these is the patients tend to self-regulate anyway, and they tend to do very well. They're, they're gonna bear as much weight as their hip can tolerate. And if it fails, it was really destined to fail. Um, and, and Ken Caval is a, is a fracture sort of advocate. Um, he's up, I believe he's still at Dartmouth right now, but he's written many papers on this subject matter, um, specifically looking at morbidity and mortality. And then we just do a couple x-rays post-operatively just to follow the fracture healing as we would for any broken bone. So the good part of the prognosis, these are the things that are success, and, they, and they're 
uh, they make sense. A younger age patient or physiologically a younger patient, patient that walked at a high level before surgery, um, uh, able to do its, their activities of daily living at a high level before surgery, living with another person because they're incentivized to do well and return to their family member and certainly ability to walk independently at the time of discharge is a huge factor of how they'll do well. But then there's the bad, and the bad is, is really why this is such a, a, a big problem in the United States. Male patients, and this has been shown in multiple countries, including the U.S., have up to a four or five times mortality within the first calendar year of their fracture. Um, anemia at admission is something that we can correct and something we have to work hard to correct because it does correlate with mortality within one calendar year. Diabetes do, does as well um, to a lesser degree in longer term. In shorter term studies, diabetes was not really found to correlate specifically with mortality. Functional outcomes uh, are something that we look at how well they're gonna perform. I mean, that's why they're here as well. And advanced age, obviously comorbidities, any complications that happen during their hospital course uh, and having a lower pre-fracture function are all gonna have negative predictive value in how they're gonna function. And then finally, how, which one of these patients are gonna need an institution afterwards, um, long-term skilled nursing facility, and again, it has to do with function, age, and to a lesser degree, gender for that variable. So, you know, why here? This is what I sort of, you know, this, is, this matches the picture that um, we put out in, in reaching out to some of the skilled nursing facilities locally. These are the six individuals that take care of, uh, we're going to be taking care of the lion's share of hip fractures here. And I think what's interesting of our group is that three of us are fellowship trained in total joint replacement. And I think the evidence is growing that total joint replacement, especially in that physiologically healthier elderly person after a fall, they, they do much better. And I think that's the kind of skill set that you want uh, brought to the table when it may be your mom or your dad or your relative or your friend with this injury. And so I think the whole reason we're here tonight is because I think we bring a total team approach and certainly as orthopedic surgeons we're just part of this team and uh, how well we do with our medicine colleagues, our emergency room colleagues and our discharge planning team as well as the skilled nursing facility is going to predict how well these patients do in the long haul because it's still, despite our best efforts, this is still a very dangerous injury to have. So thank you guys for your time. And uh, if you guys have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Yes, sir. You were talking before about kind of the, you know, judiciously using narcotics and pain control. Obviously, there are susceptible patients that have an increased rate of delirium in my fracture care use femoral nerve blocks I do prefer neuraxial anesthesia however and I find if you have a good spinal block that often that will give you just as good uh, coverage my joint experience in terms of you know, total joint replacement is that femoral nerve blocks tend to slow you down and I use them in my fellowship training extensively with total knees but I think when you look at sort of the avant-garde joint settings and in, in this hospital included Dr. Delury that really we've abandoned femoral nerve blocks to a great degree because we can we can do it with our spinal we can do it with multimodal pain control and not rely on that. Okay. I was thinking of it from a emergency department perspective it's become a procedure that some of us Sure. With, especially if it's in the evening and it's not going to happen. So yeah, I, I I don't I don't think that would have an adverse outcome on it at all. I mean it because it's like you said, we're not going to do it that night. We're going to make sure everything's optimized and ready to go. So I think if they're in extreme pain, I think that is a good, anything that's a viable option to narcotics, um, I think is good. And then here's an intermedullary nail, if you guys want to see that one. That won't fall apart. <laughs> no matter so, how hard I try that. Yeah. So anyway, any other questions at all? All right, and I'll give way to my uh, colleagues here. <laughs>